Um, welcome to our presentation. The, the title of our paper is Western Psychotherapy and Eastern Ways of Liberation, um, an Integrated Theory of Suffering and Well-Being. So I'm Charles. Uh, also in my group are Allison, Lindsay, and Alex. Um, I'm going to sort of introduce the paper and outline the what I mean by Eastern ways of liberation and sort of the fundamentals of that. And then I'll pass it on to my other group members to finish out um, our whole presentation. So psychotherapy in Western society and particularly in the U.S., um, just because that's our experience or my experience, uh, is made up of seemingly distinct disciplines or theoretical orientations. Um, some of the popular ones, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, person-centered, psychodynamic. And as trainees, um, as we all are, we're supposed to, or we're pretty much required to identify one particular theoretical orientation and then stick with that to say, I am a blank therapist. I'm a CBT therapist. And then explain why this one works or this one is right. So a somewhat recent study identified this notion um, called common factors. Uh, and so the idea is that as opposed to these different theoretical orientations and methods of psychotherapy representing different ways of helping people, of being efficacious, it's actually that all of them have these common shared factors that determine whether or not that therapy is successful. So it's not necessarily the type of therapy, but it's really like the way that it's done. Um, and there are these certain common factors that have been shown in this review study um, to determine whether or not therapy is successful. Uh, and I can have them here um, for you to take a look at what those common factors are. And so uh, one way to think of it is that maybe all these different types of therapy are like different lowercase t languages of describing a capital T truth. Um, a truth that is just uh, part of the core experience of being a human um, and that can't actually be described in one particular way but there are all these different ways that you can try to describe it they're not actually describing different things they're all different ways of describing the same thing and so our presentation and our paper sort of explored whether Eastern practices um, could be viewed as just another one of these lowercase t languages that's talking about the capital T of mental health. Um, and if that's the case, if we can explore um, the ways they may be influencing contemporary therapeutic practices in the West, um, and it, if it also might help us in our particular lowercase t language to have an understanding of Eastern practices because they've been around for so long, for several thousands of years, um, relative to the very short hundred years or so history of Western psychotherapy. Uh, and so we'll explore that a little bit today in terms of some basic understanding of Eastern, uh, what we're referring to as ways of liberation, uh, and then we'll move into some Western uh, practices and how they relate. So uh, philosopher um, and originally a theologian, and became more of a philosopher, uh, Alan Watts wrote a book called Psychotherapy East and West in 1961, which basically talked about this idea of Eastern practices and ways of liberation being something less like religion, if we're looking at it through our Western lens, and something more nearly resembling uh, psychotherapy. And he referred to uh, ways of liberation as a variety of different things, um, Advaita Vedanta, which is a type of sort of an offshoot of Hinduism, uh, Taoism, um, and he also talked about Buddhism, and in particular, Zen Buddhism. And so that's one that I'll focus on as I have a little bit of personal experience with that practice as well, uh, as an example of Eastern ways of liberation. And I also use this as an, as an example, Zen Buddhism, because several very prominent figures in the history of Western psychotherapy um, noticed this as well and became very interested and utilized this tradition uh, within their practice uh, and their understanding of psychological well-being. Um, Carl Jung, for example, Karen Horney, uh, 
uh, Fritz Perls and Eric Fromm. These all became very central to their understanding and to their practice. So I'm going to give you a very brief cliff notes sort of uh, outline of this particular way of liberation, Zen Buddhism, um, as a sort of representation of the different ways of liberation. Uh, and then we'll transition into the more Western approaches and see how they might relate. Um, so at the core of this tradition, and as Watts said, really at the core of all of these Eastern ways of liberation, is this problem of the ego. Um, the notion that you are a separate self that stands apart from your environment, um, almost as if there's a little person in the back of your head somewhere um, that is controlling everything and that is acting against the world to succeed or to do something in some way. Um, the notion of the separate self. So in Zen, um, the belief in this separate self is seen as the core, the root of all of our suffering as people. All of our suffering and really all of our dissatisfaction in life. The, the root of that is this belief, this strong belief that I exist, that Charles exists separate from my environment. Um, so this belief in the separate self being the root of all suffering. And Watts used a variety of different metaphors to help explain this concept, uh, like the notion of prioritizing one's hand over their arm. Um, like this is myself and it exists differently from this arm that it's actually in reality attached to. Uh, he also uh, used the image of a person that's trying to walk away from their own feet. And that's like, you struggling your entire life to exist and to like to win life as this separate self um, but it's impossible to walk away from your own feet and so you're like stumbling uh, through life and so then if you can see this belief is the core problem the root of all of our suffering um, Buddhism offers uh, this sort of four-step theor theoretical orientation or tenet of tenets of how to transcend this suffering and so it's it's called the four no Four Noble Truths, um, and so the first one is that life as we know it, as based on our belief in the separate self, is suffering, is dissatisfaction. So life is suffering, dissatisfaction is the first one. Second one is that suffering comes out of our belief in the separate self, um, and that is full of desire and aversion, of grasping on to this belief in the separate self and trying to um, just constantly either grasp for things or push things away based on this belief in your separate self that is existing in sort of a struggle against your environment. And so then the third noble truth is that there is an end to this suffering. And then the fourth is basically the practice of Buddhism, and all of that is an attempt to help you see through the illusion of the separate self. So the fourth one is that the way through it the way to transcend suffering is to see that this notion of the ego, of the separate self, is an illusion. And then the idea is that through simply this clear seeing, all of the suffering and all of the dissatisfaction can just naturally dissolve. Um, just via giving up this effort that really makes no sense at its core. Um, in Taoism, this is like finding the natural course of nature and, and going into harmony with that as opposed to trying to work against it. It's like following the natural course of water down a mountain as opposed to attempting to be the water that's going back up the mountain. And that makes no sense, just based on uh, the fact of reality in nature. And then so if those four noble truths are like the theoretical orientation or the like the basic tenets of understanding of how suffering occurs and how it's transcended, the practice then, or the kind of methodology, is to seek the help of what's called a guru figure. Um, and so a guru, it's something close to meaning shedding light. So it's just uh, the act of showing you more of the perspective in the picture. And Watts compared this role to that of the psychotherapist. Um, and so what the guru does is models this way of being because they've dedicated their life to this sort of practice, um, to this seeing clearly through the illusion of the separate self. Uh, and so they model this way of being, and they also point out the different ways that the, the person practicing uh, 
um, is acting upon this illusion directly. Um, and so it's not really a conceptual back and forth, but it's the student is acting upon their belief in the separate self, and the guru can point that out and say, like, oh, well, there you go. You're, you're, um, who is this you that uh, you're referring to? Um, and so both modeling and then pointing out, and I think that kind of mirrors a lot of what psychotherapy is um, or can be. In addition to the support of the guru figure, um, the student also practices some form of consistent meditation. Uh, some method, um, I mean, there's lots of different ways of describing meditation, but some way of just like consistently on a daily basis trying to see through all of the filters that have been built up over the course of your entire life and just see as clearly as you possibly can. Um, like in different, I think modern psychotherapies, I think in CBT they use this metaphor of wearing a particular pair of glasses um, that you've built up over your, the course of your lifetime and like and gradually uh, wiping off all of the shit that's on top of those glasses that's been built up. And that's sort of what I believe anyways that meditation is is just this noticing of the glasses that you're wearing and again and again wiping off the stuff that's on top of them so you can see more and more clearly and then in these Eastern ways of liberation the ultimate aim of that is to be able to see clearly into and through the uh, illusion that you are a separate self that your self exists different from your environment um, and that you can only really feel and reap the benefits of that for your life if you see it directly. Um, so it's both via this practice with the guru um, and also consistent and diligent meditation practice to just see clearly into these illusions that are built up over the course of life. And then through seeing that, the, through seeing clearly, the suffering and the dissatisfaction can just gradually kind of wash away. I hope that sort of makes some basic sense. Um, I mean, who am I to explain this stuff? But I, I do dedicate quite a bit of my time to understanding um, the impact of this sort of practice and what it really means at its base. Um, and so I realized that this notion of the separate self can be, it can sound pretty strange, uh, especially in a Western context where it seems like individualism and this notion of me and I'm going to do things and act upon things and become my individual self and conquer the world in some way. Um, that's such a part of the fabric of our Western society, particularly America. Uh, so it can be challenging to understand this sort of notion of there is no separate self that's an illusion. Um, and so I wonder how that actually might be playing out in our Western uh, modes of therapy in terms of moving towards well-being and moving out of suffering. Um, but maybe just using different lowercase t language to describe that same kind of thing. Uh, and so that being said, um, I hope that made some sense and I'll, I'll move on to uh, Allison for the next part of this um, exploration, which looks at uh, third wave cognitive uh, therapies and the potential influence of Eastern ways of liberation.